Welcome to the Finance and Operations Committee meetings for April 30th, 2024. The meeting of the Finance and Operations Committee will please come to order. All board members previously polled this evening are still present. The district posted this evening's agenda to board docs at least 24 hours prior to the commencement of this meeting. Is there a motion to approve that previously posted agenda? So moved. Second. Are there any amendments to offer? There are no amendments. The agenda has been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, please signify by saying I oppose. Those abstaining, please signify by saying I abstain. Motion carried. I will now turn over the Finance and Operations Committee meeting um, to uh, Director Rogers uh, to please begin with an overview of your agenda items for this evening. Tonight we have one agenda item. It is the 2024-2025 proposed final budget, which we'll be asking the board for board action to move it to the May uh, regular voting meeting. Uh, so the presentation is in compliance with the Act 1 timeline. I will be presenting the 24-25 proposed general fund budget. We'll also, as I said, be asking uh, the board to be considered of this budget for approval at the May 14th meeting, more specifically. Uh, and the final budget presentation will be held on June 18th, 2024, which will incorporate any legislative or and or internal changes. This time, if you'd like me to go straight into the presentation, I can. Go right into it, yep. So again, tonight we're gonna to be discussing the 24-25 proposed final budget. So we'll start out with the Act 1 timeline and where we stand as of tonight. So prior to this meeting on November 28th, 2023, which is the November committee meeting for the board, we gave a presentation on the preliminary budget versus a process versus an accelerated opt-out uh, process. That What was reviewed that night, which we'll continue to review in the next few slides, is a base index of 5.3 and, an, and or an adjusted index of 7.9% specific Upper Darby School District. We asked the board to move forward with an accelerated opt-out. Uh, they chose to move forward with that opt-out, which on December 5th, 2023, the board approved the resolution not to exceed 7.9% for the annual tax increase for the 24-25 fiscal year. So as it stands right now, with the opt-out resolution being approved on December 5th, the board will not and cannot exceed the adjusted index for the district of 7.9 in the budget year 24-25. So the remaining portions of the Act 1 timeline outside of tonight and what will follow, obviously, is from this presentation, we'll ask the board for their consideration to move this budget forward to the May 14th voting meeting. We'll put forward a, a resolution for the board to adopt a proposed final budget. That night, the budget will also become available in uh, in the PDE form 2028, which will be considered uh, available for public inspection at that time. On May 28th, we'll have the May committee meeting where we'll have another discussion surrounding the budget. We'll update the board and the public on any changes that may happen from now till that, that time. Uh, on May 8th, no later than May 8th, uh, we will post the advertisement of a notice of intent to adopt the final budget on June 18th. On June 18th, that is the committee meeting. as it's been in the past few years. We will present the night of the 18th. Following the presentation, we'll ask the board at a special voting meeting to vote on the final budget with all changes that we would possibly incorporate at that time. Uh, so that would be the presentation on the 18th as well as a special voting meeting that asks the board to adopt the final budget. Uh, I just always put on here that based on PD requirements, and the state requirements, we are required to, in, under the Act 1 timeline, have a budget passed no later than June 30th of this year, of 2024. So that is the absolute latest date the board can adopt the final budget. So again, just to go through uh, what was presented back in November, uh, here is a representation of the base and adjusted index for the current year, 23-24. And in the gold box there, you see 24-25, which is this budget year that we're discussing. Uh, so the current year, which is the budget we passed last year, base index was 4.1, the adjusted index was 6%. This current year, it's increased. The base index for this across the state is 5.3. For Upper Darby, the adjusted index is 7.9. And again, the board passed an opt-out resolution 
that we will not and cannot exceed that adjusted index. So historically, again, from the presentation in November, we like to look through, you know, over the past eight years or so, uh, going back on what the tax increases have actually been in the district. So you'll see, you know, left to right, the year starting 2020, uh, 2016, 17, all the way through this current year, 24, 25. Uh, and then as you go from the top down, you see Upper Darby School District in yellow. That was the actual board approved final budget tax increase. The correlated right underneath that, you have the correlating base index and adjusted index. So you can read it top, uh, top down, left to right. Uh, and again, that yellow is what actually occurred in the district and what was approved. Uh, the graph underneath is just a visual representation of, of, you know, where our actual increase came in, the purple bar being the actual increase, the gray being the base index, and the gold being the adjusted index. So if you look from left to right outside of the 17, 18, 18, 19 school years, you could see that we were, you know, at or below the base index, let alone well below the adjusted index. Past two years, right at a 1% tax increase, prior two to that, we're around 2.6. So you can see, uh, you know, where we've been trending as far as uh, tax increases year over year. What we usually tr try to point out at this point here is when you're looking at the 16-17 school year, you do see the board uh, did approve a 0% tax increase. And then after those years, you can actually see where it jumped up to 2.89, 2.5, 1.9, 2.6, 2.6, and then back to the past two years at a 1%. Uh, typically, when you go out with a 0% tax increase, school districts may end up chasing that into the future, trying to make up for the lost uh, revenue in those budget years, which is where this next slide comes in. You'll see, again, from left to right, prior to that 16-17 budget year where we went out with a 0%, the board was bouncing their budget with a use of fund bounce about $2.5 million. In that year where we went to a 0% tax increase, we actually had to bounce the budget with a $6.5 million use of fund bounce. So as you go left from right, it jumped up in 17 to over $7 million. And then from there, moving out to where we are up through this current school year, 23, 24, we've done a very good job of being able to maintain and bring that use of fund bound slowly down to right about the $4 million mark. Uh, and for the board members who had, have been here the past couple of years, uh, we typically, and back in 15, 16, this is, this is the same, the numbers have just grown. Uh, we usually look at about Right now, I'd say about $4 million in the budget of lost salaries, meaning we budget staffing at 100%. And throughout a normal school year, we're likely not to spend roughly around $4 million in salaries and benefits in vacant positions, unfilled positions, all due to the, you know, the teacher staffing crisis that's a national crisis. If you go back to the 15-16, I'd say that's a balanced budget at a use of $2.5 million. That's just the difference in what the market looks like as far as staffing in 15, 16 versus all the way up to 23, 24. So if you look all the way to the right, you're going to see that tonight's budget that we're, we're presenting, the proposed final budget, has a use of fund balance of $8.8 .8 million, which is obviously higher than it has been all the way back for, you know, all the way back through the years that we're representing here. So we will dive into those actual numbers here. Uh, but the proposed budget is a budget with uh, revenues at 256, almost 0.5 million, and expenditures at 265.3, leaving an 8.8 .8 million dollar shortfall and use of fund bounce to bounce the budget. So, what makes up those numbers? Uh, here are some of the assumptions as it stands tonight. This budget has a proposed 3% tax increase. And again, that's below the base index of 5.3 and the adjusted of 7.9. We did not include any increase to state funding. So level funding from the state. So, and that's very important to highlight it, you know, it's bold there, underlined. To be clear, the revenue does not include any additional funds from the state. That being said, the current governor's proposed budget has basic ed education funding for the district specifically increasing by $16.7 million. The breakdown of that $16.7 million is roughly $2 million coming through the weighted formula distribution, which is an existing distribution that was created a few years ago. And then there's an adequacy investment of almost $14.7 million. So there are districts throughout the county and the tri-county area who 
are budgeting anywhere from no increase to only what was in the weighted formula, most if not all that I'm aware of are, are not including the adequacy investment because we're not so confident whether or not that's really going to make it to the district in this current upcoming year's budget. Um, I'd say that a conservative, you know, a, a, this is a conservative obviously going out with a, a flat funding. Um, the, you know, most aggressive I'd probably with what we know right now, the most aggressive I would think the district would be comfortable going is maybe that weighted formula or maybe a percentage of the weighted formula distribution. But at this time with what we know, we're putting forward a proposed budget with no increase to state funding. And that's the basic ed side. The special ed in the governor's uh, proposal is $664,000 of an increase. Again, not included in this budget. Um, this budget includes a, 20, a bond issuance for the 24-25 school year to address capital projects. Uh, it also includes $11.8 million in ESSER funding. Uh, the ESSER spending timelines will be evaluated through and up to the final budget and adjust it for any, any uh, changes that may come all the way up through June. Uh, just to keep in mind, ESSER funding really runs out at the end of September uh, other than any obligated funds for construction. So if there are any obligated funds for some of the construction projects we're doing, if for some reason they're not completed by the end of September, all of ours are already or will shortly be obligated. So we'll be well within that time frame, um, and we're hoping to have everything closed out by you know, the beginning of next school year, if not, you know, all funds expended by the end of September. Uh, but there's a little bit of leadway when it comes to some of the construction projects that are already fully obligated. I'll also say in the, you're going to see as we go through the presentation that it's a little bit different than some of the prior year presentations. I'm going to call out some of the ESSER funding to try and give a, a more accurate picture of a net budget that didn't, if it didn't include ESSER uh, for comparison purposes to prior the prior year or the this current school year that we're in. Uh, included in the budget considerations for staffing changes, we have four new EL positions, and then you're gonna see on the right-hand side uh, adjustments to existing positions. So we're taking multiple vacant, position, uh, vacant professional staff, and we're going to be reassigning them based on various needs, whether it be by building location and or the subject matter uh, that they may be certified to teach in. Uh, we, in addition, are actually removing the program that we put in place for this current year's budget, the 23-24 teacher apprenticeship program. Uh, with how our budget is currently looking, we went through the process of, of creating the program, and uh, at this point in time, it, it doesn't financially make sense for the district to keep pushing that program forward when we already have quite a decent budget gap uh, that we're presenting here. So you know, that program is being removed, unfortunately, um, and although it had only made it through this, this current school year. So here's a, a representation of a comparison for this, the 23-24 final budget and then the 24-25 proposed final budget. So reading top down, you're gonna see revenues first. In this comparison, we show revenues net of any tax increase. So this is as if there's no tax increase whatsoever and you'll see it as we move down uh, this slide here. So for 24-25, it's 253, almost 0.2 million in revenues. Expenditures are at 265, 323,000, leaving expenditures exceeding the revenues by $12.1 million. If you factor in a 3% tax increase, that'll add roughly $3.3 .3 million to the revenue, offsetting that uh, use of fund balance down to that 8.8 .8 million that we presented a few slides ago. Now this is just the annual impact on taxpayers based on the current assessments. So you'll see in the gold there at 3%, and you can go left to right, depending on the assessment of the property, anywhere from $50,000 up to 350. dollars uh, You can see it's $38 all the way up to 264 dollars annually. That's an annual increase to your taxes going in the next year. So any tax increase from zero all the way to the adjusted index, you can see on the grid uh, how that may impact you know, a residential property in, in the community. A little bit more of a deep dive into the revenue here. So we'll go at a high level, break it down, the revenue broken down by local, state, federal, and other sources. So what you'll see here is, you know, you can see the numbers there. I'll talk about more of, of the percentages here, but they all break down the total revenue that we discussed in the previous slide. So about 47% coming from local funds, 
45 from state, 8% from federal, and 900,000 or 0% of the total revenue. Uh, you'll see that this is actually, in comparison to last year, a decrease in revenue of $9.1 million or a decrease of 3.43%. And this is where that conversation about ESSER comes in to make sure that we can get a better comparison of what the district general operating really was net of ESSER. So if you look at that box in the purple uh, right below that, if we were to remove ESSER funding from last year's revenue and this year's to get a true comparison, if ESSER was not part of this conversation, what are the actual funding model of the district that's sustainable and not going away come this September? Uh, you'll see that it goes, it's actually a $4.6 million increase going into this year at 1.93 roughly percent of an increase. So as we go through these next slides, we typically don't have the conversation that there's a stark difference in how much ESSER funding was in the current year, the 23-24 budget, versus ESSER's running out in September, a few months in the next year's budget. So we have about $11 million in ESSER funding versus, you know, about, you know, mid $20 million mark from the uh, current year, 23-24. So you'll see call outs on a lot of these slides to show more accurate comparisons net of ESSER. And I'll I'll point them out as we work through. Uh, again, here's a breakdown. This is the local revenue. If you were to take the 47% and then break it out even further, 42 of that 47 is local tax, meaning the tax bill that goes out July 1 every year and is collected from the taxpayers. The 5% other local taxes, anything that could be delinquent taxes collected years after the fact, it could be transfer tax, um, you know, a few other taxes that fall into that area is 5%, just showing that that local burden is the vast majority of that 47% being 42% uh, on the annual tax bill that goes out each year. This is a deeper dive into the local funds. Uh, so reading straight down, you're gonna see the account code, six, the 6,000 that stands for local funds. Um, and then you can read down taxes levied, delinquent taxes, uh, er earnings on investments, revenues from district activities, revenues from intermediate sources, pass through funds and other revenues of local sources. So you can see that breakdown as you go down. And again, from a percentage perspective, that 6,100 is the vast majority of those, uh, that 42% that we discussed on the previous slide. Uh, in comparison to last year's local funds, it's a two point, roughly $2.2 .2 million increase at 1.9%. You will not see the ESSER cut out here or the next slide because they're local funds, state funds. You don't see it again until federal because it is federal funding. So here's the state funding. So you have basic ed, special ed funding, uh, revenues for non-educational programs, uh, additional state revenues, other grants that may come out from year to year, uh, and then revenue from the state for, it's really Social Security and PISA's reimbursement, which is a, is a decent uh, portion of this, this uh, budget. But you can see the numbers as you, as you read down, the largest piece obviously being basic ed uh, funding at the top there with the $61.2 million. So we're netting out here a $2.6 million increase, which is about 2.3 million or 2.3 percent on uh, as an increase of last year's budget for state sources. And again, although I presented there's no increase to the basic ed or special ed funding, the vast majority of that increase there is driven by the revenue from the state for Social Security and PISA's reimbursement. It's a calculation that is based off of our aid ratios or the common level ratio go th and um, whatever our wages may be that are budgeted. So it, it's off of total wages, calculated back. The state has a formula where we get a portion reimbursed to us for Social Security and also uh, PISERS. Here's the federal revenue, uh, and you'll see that it's $20.98 million. Last year it was $34.9 million. So you can see that there's, you know, we're decreasing by 13 million, 13.9. So the vast majority of that is the difference of that ESSER funding. The current year has roughly $11 million in ESSER funding. And last year was roughly $24 million uh, in funding. So you're gonna see it kind of off to the left there in the purple. Uh, ESSER net of, or federal funding net of ESSER, you're gonna see that it actually still is a decrease of $170,000 at one point, a decrease of 1.8%. And that's mostly related to our title programs and the allocations changed multiple times throughout the year. So the allocations we had when we did the 23-24 budget were accurate at that time. 
student counts come in and the allocations change throughout the year and it has gone down slightly. Uh, so that's really what's driving the, the decrease there. Uh, the interfund transfers related to overhead costs that are charged back to our food service fund. That's always, we always keep that pretty, pretty stagnant at that $900,000. So there's no increase there uh, going into this year's budget. So at this time, we'll switch over to the expenditure side of the presentation. And again, you can see the, the dollar amounts uh, on your left-hand side here broken down from instructional costs, support services, non-instructional, infrastructure, debt service, prior uh, refund of expenditures or revenues, and then transfer capital reserve and the contingency. Uh, so uh, the vast majority, the instructional costs at 59% and the support services at 27% makes up the, the absolute majority of the expenditures within the district. So what falls into those two categories are direct instruction. So your teachers, all your support staff, uh, any kind of special services, emotional, social learning support, all fall into those categories, which is obviously what is the main driving factor behind uh, what we do here as a district. So this is just a different way of looking at it from a function category down to what's called the object category. So this is a breakout of salary and benefits, purchase services, and then supplies and other. Uh, so you can see that the district's budget is driven, 63% of the expenditures are driven by salaries and benefits. Uh, when you look at the face value change here, we're actually decreasing by almost 4.5 4 million or a 1.7% decrease. Again, if we net out the ESSER funding, we're actually increasing by $9.2 million, 3 point, almost 8% increase over last year's budget. So when you go into the salaries and benefits, this is a further breakdown showing the actual personnel costs, the first line 107.5 million, that's actual salaries related to staffing district-wide. Then you have the health benefits, so medical, uh, prescription, dental, all of the health benefits that are offered to our employees, social security reimbursement, uh, retirement being PEASERS and other very large expense to the district that's mandated and then other, any other benefits that may fall outside of those categories. So you'll see that the increase here is $829,000 or a half percent. Netting out ESSER, it's actually 1.7 or 1% increase, um, which would likely be higher if we were still keeping the student apprenticeship program or the teacher apprenticeship program that we removed. Um, but because as I said before, where we stand with the current budget, it, it was in the district's best interest to remove those costs and be able to ha have a little bit more cost containment coming into this budget, even though we're already presenting an $8.8 .8 million use of fund bounce. The next categories are the 300s, 400s, and 500s, which are all purchase services, third-party uh, services that are pr provided to the district. Uh, you know, and you're gonna see that that's a decrease of 189,000. Net of ESSER, it's actually a $4.3 million increase or 7.38% of an increase. In the last section here are the supplies and others and other expenses. Uh, this is you know, decreasing by $5 million. Net of ESSER, it's actually a $3.2 million increase or 15.18% increase. What is really sticking out here from a percentage perspective is a lot of the technology and software costs that were picked up by ESSER are transferred back into the district budget. Um, and therefore, you know, that looks like a very high percentage at 15%, uh, but driving in that $3 million most is related to um, technology costs throughout the district. And again, just to review the Act 1 timeline previously presented, following this meeting, we'll hope that the board will move it for a vote at the May 14th meeting and adopt the resolution uh, for the proposed final budget. Again, that night it'll be made public, uh, available for public inspection on the PDE 2028. On May 28th at the committee meeting, we'll have another discussion updating the board and the public on any, any changes that may have come uh, from now till then. Uh, we will, at no later than June 8th, provide an advertisement with the notice, notice of intent to adopt the final budget. On June 18th, there'll be a committee meeting presentation followed by a special voting meeting for the final budget. Uh, and again, the latest the board can adopt the budget is June 30th of 2024. This time, if the board has any questions. Very good presentation, Craig. I do have three questions, if you don't mind uh, answering them. First one being, 
how much money would you want to see fr- coming from the governor in any final budget that would bring the tax increase on the community below the 3% because I'm looking through all the different facets of the budget and it's as bare bones as you can get because we do require all these services for our students and 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 all those kinds of things so I don't I I see that the investment is worth it uh, I just want a little bit of parameter around that second question is does the administration have any concerns on the timing of when we would receive any monies from the state given that this past school year we didn't even get that fiscal code approved until several months after they passed their already late budget so that's kind of incredulous to me I, I, that would be cool if it made sense uh, the third thing is I am concerned that even with that three percent cut or rather the three percent proposed tax increase that we're still basically taking out very close to ten million dollars, eight point eight million dollars from our from our uh, rainy day fund. And what would the administration's concerns be when it comes to when we get our financial audit and we're pr- getting primed and ready to uh, take out money and borrow money? What would that do to our rating? What would that do to our ability to get a really good rate? So I know I packed a whole lot in there, but feel free to answer whatever you can. I'll take a I'll take a, a crack at the three, and then you can fill in the fill in the uh, I guess the mortar around the joints, so to speak. Uh, first and foremost, I mean, obviously, uh, great questions. Uh, hopefully, I, I go through all of them. I want to summarize them back, if that's okay. One cost that we would like to receive, if there is any money coming from the state, as far as a way to offset the tax increase. Second, um, obviously, uh, what we're able to do and not able to do with the finances. Um, programmatically, because uh, you're, as you call it, bare bones, there are a lot of extra things that we're losing uh, in this conversation um, that's important. Um, so capital improvements and projects like that from the, la- the lack of revenue. Um, and then obviously, what would we do if the money were to come in and the concern related to the $8 million use of fund balance? Like, are we concerned about that? Is that another three fair to say? Okay. So for, obviously, first and foremost, on slide seven, if we can go to slide seven for our viewing audience that's, uh, that's up, um, this is really complicated stuff, so, so much so that when you talk to even uh, local politicians or politicians on a state level, there's still a lack of understanding from the writing this, the final writing of what some of this language means. So I'll start with the adequacy investment. If we can toggle back and forth between slide seven and the slide that shows the historical tax increases um, here in the district, uh, I've, read, I've met recently with Senator Carney, huge advocate supporting the district and the funding increases. Uh, just last evening, had a conversation with um, Representative Boyd and had a phone conversation uh, with Representative Curry, and I'll be on that panel Thursday night. I had asked a question, and this is what's out there in the public right now. So if you go left to right on the base index and adjusted index on this slide, and it relates to this adequacy tax index, The concern that I have to answer your $8.8 million, and we'll fill the the rest in, is technically, as it is presented, we should be taxing at a minimum to the base index, according to the language that's being pushed out there, and also should really be considering every single year from 1617 to 2425 going to the adjusted index every single year. And so what the fight is about right now in Harrisburg, some school districts like Upper Darby, even though it's out there and I know our taxes are high in Upper Darby, I'm not saying that they're not, but relatively speaking, this administration and the, uh, the board has stayed below the base index and tr- balancing what we know our taxpayers can and can't afford. The argument has been twofold. One, what's out there with this adequacy tax, number one, is School districts who have not maxed out their taxes are losing out in that adequacy tax. They're not getting the money. And their concern is, wait, let me get this straight. Because I didn't tax as much as I could, I'm not going to get dollars for that because my community can afford to be taxed more. So I want to make sure the public understands that. They can afford to be taxed more. My concern, Damien, when I talk to our state leaders, I'm worried that that, that, that the 1% tax increases And this year, the 3% tax increase, will that come back to haunt us because we're not maxing out our taxes? And is the seven-year plan mean we'll get less money 
to close that gap. When we ask those questions, Craig and I and the board members that were a part of the meetings, there isn't a hard and fast answer yet because it hasn't been finalized what it means, what the language actually means there, which makes me concerned here as well. To your question about how much money would we need, let's say we got the $2 million uh, that Craig, talk, Craig talked about. We could probably bring the taxes down somewhere at about 1.5%, let's say, if we receive that, 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 that dollar amount. Again, is that the wise thing to do, knowing this adequacy tax gap is there? That's a concern right? The other issue is from future concerns, we will have to negotiate every time, and, and Craig does a masterful job with it, uh, negotiate the, the bond rating. Every year we use more of our fund balance and we don't tax because the bond raters also want us to tax as much as we can to have that, that dollars and cents in our fund balance. It's, it's a hurt to the district. We're negotiating our bond rating. Why does that matter? The higher our bond rating, the better the interest rates will be on the money we need to borrow for capital projects. So once again, I've said this in many public meetings, it is a vicious cycle. If we, if we, and we were thinking, do we put at least $2 million thinking, crossing our fingers, we're going to get it. In the conversations we've had with state reps and local leaders, they're not so sure what we're going to get. And we're certainly not going to get it on time again, which is the other concern. What do we do? I'm very concerned, as, as Craig pointed out, I agree with him, most school district budgets are always in personnel. The costs are always related to personnel. Here in Upper Darby, um, we have new contracts, but keeping up with those contracts, if some local um, taxes change here locally or competing interests uh, happen as far as paying more salaries. Some school districts are passing new contracts at far higher rates. Teachers will then go to those school districts. And it's this cycle we're chasing after. I think we should be trying to fix in the governor's proposal, paying teachers better it would be a huge help. Which leads me to the other part of this funding that's complicated. The reason why the $1 million plan that we had, or a little bit $1 million with our own Grow Your Own program, has kind of gone by the wayside and this is not meant to be disrespectful. I think PD has tried to figure out something as well. There's too many people trying to not to try to take a, a crack at solving the teacher shortage. Instead of getting all these higher education universities together in the room, seeing it's a priority, and putting it as a priority. Here's an example. In the governor's proposal, as I've presented it to all the home and schools, and I want to thank our board president for speaking, Ms. Kimberly Glenn and Ms. Brittany Williams for going and advocating in Harrisburg, um, there is this idea of a teacher stipend. Well, on the first day of the teacher stipend window when it opened, 4,000 student teachers applied. And it was only meant to fund 650 student teachers. So it, would, it needs $75 million uh, to get people to be student teachers to pay them. And I made this announcement early on, like the math doesn't add up. Even if there were only 3,000 student teachers, you need at least $30 million to give that. So now... Most of these student teachers are not going to get the stipend in this proposal to encourage them to be student teachers, to pay that dollar amount. So there's a lot of broken facets that need to be worked out in this. And there really isn't as much fine print as you'd like to read to understand where is this money going. My concern to this board and this public is, does the adequacy investment mean we cannot raise taxes? Because $14 million, not to sound greedy, is shy of what I think we need. We need at least, I think, $20 million a year in this district to be able to say to our taxpayers, we're gonna provide that level of relief. And I made this clear in several calls with our state leaders and Senator Carney that I would like some clarity as far as what does the adequacy tax mean? Does it mean if that money comes, there are no tax increases? Because we're still behind what we need to improve our schools. As we all know, our schools are eight, on average 83 years old, right? And so we have, we have a big, big deal, big gap that's there. So for me, um, they're my concerns. Obviously the $2 million is a, nice, is a nice effort. It would allow us to bring those taxes down again. But the question we come back to, to the board, it's a great question, Damien, is do we want to stay with a 1%, 1.5% increase? Or do we want to try to stay at around 25 3 Only because there are all these unknown questions about how does this adequacy investment long-term happen? There was discussion that it was supposed to be a seven-year plan. There's only been one year discussed. 
even even politically both sides are questioning where are years you know two through seven they're not anywhere published yet so we don't know where those dollars are i hope i i did a uh, did my best to answer that craig anything you want to add to that the only thing i'll add is so year over year and i'll start with dan's point of saying it's a seven-year plan they put out in year one almost 17 million dollars for the district so that gives you an idea if you break that out over seven years what do we really need I think it's very clear our millage rate is higher than it should be. It costs more to educate children in a district like Upper Darby. We should have more funding and lower a lower millage rate based on the economics within Upper Darby and the demograph. That's known. There's scientific studies. We've gone through this before. It's a broken system. The Act 1 system is completely broken. If Dr. Haig was here, I would just hit mute and let her explain it because she does it so much better than I can. She's done it for the past, I guess, two or three years she would bring it up. But it's a broken system. It, it's recognized now that it's a broken system. It's whether or not how, it, how quickly can it be fixed. But the bottom line is $16.7 million is a huge dollar amount, and it looks like a very large dollar amount. But it's really only a drop in the buck in the grand scheme of things. If you look back through our budgets, and we say that we were using $2.5 million of use of fund balance to balance our budget, and now this current year, we're saying a bounce budget is using $4.2 million, meaning we don't, we're, we're budgeting fully staffed. And we're not going to be able to spend that money because we're not going to be able to staff the positions. There's just a crisis, shortage, and where our rates are, even though we think we've done a great job with the board's approval to get teacher con a, an updated teacher contract to give us the ability to recruit. The market keeps, the, keeps changing. So the districts who have more money are able to then renegotiate their contracts. And we're constantly chasing and trying to be innovative to get ahead of the curve when we can. But all that being said, if $4.2 million is what we think is a balanced budget, we're already at 8.8. .8. We're short by, you know, $4.6 million at a 3% tax increase. We got to figure out where that gap is, $4.6 million. So even with the state's funding of $2 million, there's still more, in my opinion, that needs to be either removed or made up for in some other way another revenue source, a reduction of expenditures. You know, one of those two things has to happen in order to really get down to what we think is a balanced budget. That leads me into your other question. Is it a good budget practice to go out with an $8.8 .8 million use of fund balance? No. Because if you spend it year over year, you're going to run out of fund balance. It's happened to districts locally. When that happens, you, are, you can go in the receivership, you can get taken over by the state in that process, or you may need to go out and borrow money just to make your, your ends meet, right? To be able to pay your bills. That's not a financially healthy position to be in, and it's one that we will do everything we can to not put the district in that position. So no, it's not a good budget practice to go out with an $8.8 .8 million use of fund bounce. If we're sitting here, just like we were last year or the year before, I'd be confident to say right around that $4 million mark, I'm confident in a budget using $4 million of fund bounce because I've seen what the staffing trends have shown over the past 10 years. We aren't able to fill those jobs. So then circle back, give us the funding, change the contracts, pay the teachers more, we'll recruit them. As Dan has said before, and it's not comfortable for a CFO to say this, but let's have the teachers be the best paid, highest paid teachers in the Tri-County, if not the state, right? At that point, give us the funding, let us show you what we can really do with the funding. So then you're not budgeting a use of fund bounce. You would want a balanced budget because I would hope that if we have the funding and we can pay the teachers the best in the area, if not the state, we would be able to spend that money. We'd fill the positions. We'd be able to fight for, you know, the ability to, to fill the positions. So it's somewhat of a loaded question, but the bottom line is we've done the best we can do with what we've been given. And the past couple of years budgets we've done, we would have asked for more staffing. And we had plans in the curriculum loss list. The whole team had requests that were pages long of what we really need from, for supports to be able to run our schools appropriately. The bottom line is when you have a staffing crisis, you know that you're not going to fill some of the positions we already have. So Dan is a big advocate of saying, how, how can we go out tax to add positions that we really do need, but aren't going, won't be able to, might not be able to fill them? So that's why over the past few, two years, and you can see here, we were at that $4 million use of fund bounce with a 1% tax increase. That was really driven by the, the economy and what was going on in the teacher market. 
But if the teacher market was graduating the high rates that it used to, our budgets would have looked different because we would have been asking for the staff that we would have needed because we would have been able to fill the positions. So give us the funding and we'll be able to fill, fill the positions. So, you know, that really would change what it looks like in the future. Now, your other point of how does it impact us with the rating when we go out for debt issuance? Dan's dead on. A, a rating agency is looking at us as a financial entity as if they're issuing us a mortgage, right? You're gonna get a credit, you're gonna get your credit checked, you're gonna be rated on how likely are you to pay your bills, essentially. So if as a school district, it's just another market for them. They're not worried about what we do on a daily basis. They're worried, are we going to pay our debt? Are we gonna make the pay debt payments on time every single year for the next 20 or 30 years when, when, when they issue a new bond? That's how it's rated. So at that time, they look at us like a financial entity. So to Dan's point of how much do you increase taxes, they're looking at, hang on a second, you can increase your revenue. Forget about taxes. They, they forget that it's taxes real quick. That just becomes your revenue line item. So you can increase your revenue by 7.9%. So if I'm a private company and I have the ability to raise my revenue by 7.9%, but I come out and I only increase it by three and I'm showing a use of fund balance, that's a tough sell. Are you, are you being fiscally responsible if you're being run as a Fortune 500 company? And that's a tough sell for the, the rating agencies. Now, typically, our rating through Moody's, the person who does the rating, they're specific to school districts. They have a much better understanding than if you were to pull someone from you know, the, the tech industry or something like that. Um, the way we've been able to frame it for the past few years is looking at our budgets, having the idea that that $4 million mark is right where we think it, and know that we have 10 year trends of showing staffing, we're not gonna spend the money. So why would we go out and tax anything above that? You know, We're not allowed to tax where we go show a budget where we're adding money to the fund balance in the budget. Um, so we've been able to frame it that way. Right now, if I had a call with an $8.8 .8 million use of fund balance and I'm going out at 3%, absolutely, that's not going to be a positive impact on our rating at all. Um, but we're hopeful that you know, we're able to bring our, the budget to the final uh, vote at, a, at a, better, you know, a better outlook. Hopefully we'll have more information from the state that is a more positive outlook. Um, and then we'll balance you know, what is the tax increase. We'll continue to look at the expenditures, just like I said, you either have to increase revenue or decrease expenditures. So any areas that we have control over that we feel we can either decrease some of the expenditures or, or take a harder look at revenues and see if there's anything there. Uh, that's what we always do from this time until the final budget. It will change from now till June. It always does. Um, we're always looking to come out with a better, more refined budget uh, as we go through the process. And typically, as you get more information, you hope that it's positive and you know, when the, the final budget in a much better place. We have been able to do that over the past five years. I, I hope it continues. Um, but this is where we are right now, uh, presenting it with no increase to state funding. Uh, I'll say, and since Dr. Haig's not here, base index and adjusted index is basically the state saying, this is money we're not giving you. Go get it yourself. Right? That's, that's basically the state saying, you know what? You need, oh, almost 8% more. But we're not giving it to you. Go get it yourself. Right? And the state understands that. And, you know, and a lot of these conversations, uh, it does seem like that Harrisburg and um, the financial entities we deal with, uh, they don't, they really don't think about the residents that have to pay the taxes. And we get punished, the district gets punished for thinking about them, right? For, if you go to one of the slides with the trends, Right, the yellow bar, yeah. We get, we get punished for considering the situation people were in during a pandemic. Um, we get punished by lenders and bond agencies. We get punished by Harrisburg, right, for not going out at least to that base, that base index, uh, for not ever touching the adjusted index. Um, school districts get punished for that. And, and it's a shame because... Because we are conscious, we a lot of us have family, not just ourselves, but have family. My parents live here; they're on a, you know, a fixed income, and um, 
we're trying to be considerate of those people paying those bills. And sometimes, sometimes it seems like we're the only ones, right? Um, slide eight. Uh, right here, this removal of this program is the most frustrating thing for me because this was an innovation by this administration to solve a problem that's a national problem, right? And it's the classic bootstraps thing, right? We're picking ourselves up. I hate that phrase, but that's what we were doing. We we're like, this is a problem nobody else is helping. We'll try and solve it on our own. And and we did that, right? We did that. We gave it a shot. And, and because we don't know what we're getting, we can't pay for it. And it's like, it, it is a, I just feel it's frustrating that the problem is um, a lack of teachers. And so we're trying to solve it, and now we can't solve it. And it's not going to help, you know, it's not going to help things. I don't feel like we're shooting ourselves in the foot. I feel like someone's taken our hand and forced us to shoot ourselves in the foot by not being able to have that program. I don't know how much that program costs us. We don't have to get into those details, but it's frustrating. Um, everybody was, you guys were talking about, like, if we got a little bit more, what would we do? Uh, uh, for me, you know, if, if, the, if Washington's not going to take care of it and Harrisburg's not going to take care of it, I would love for us to try a chance to take care of that. That's not a policy or anything like that I'm putting forth, but for me that's the most frustrating thing is that we can't, we, we can't try and fix that. Um, that's all I have. Nobody else has anything? No? Okay. Um, I'm going to go to comments. At this time, are there any public comments? Okay. Mr. Rogers, will you review the agenda items presented this evening? Again, we only had one agenda item tonight, the 24-25 proposed final budget, which will ask for board action. Uh, so again, we've reviewed the Act 1 timeline and walked through the current proposed general fund budget. Uh, at this time, I'd like to ask the board to move this budget forward for a vote at the May 14th uh, board meeting. All right, is, is, the board in, is the board in support of moving this forward? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. All right, thank you. So you do have that support. This will be moved forward at the, to the voting meeting. Thank you. Um, a motion is in order for the adjournment of the Finance and Operations Committee meeting. So moved. Okay. Do I need second. second. All right, this meeting is adjourned.